Hey everybody, we're just getting started here. Thanks for being here today. I need just a minute to get my screen set up and I'll share it with you. All right, well, good afternoon. I hope you're all well. Um, give me some feedback here. I wanna make sure that you can see my main screen. I believe you can, which is the introductory slide. It says test ideation of mini workshop. It has my name on it. And then also you should be able to see my face. So if you can just mention in the questions section or in the chat session or somewhere in the questions section would be just fine. Um, let me know that you can see that great. I'm getting some feedback there. Terrific. Great, that's, that's plenty. Thank you all very much. So I'm very excited about this. I welcome, I'm so glad to have you here today. Um, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, we did a couple of these in the past of mini workshops where we tried to get some, some conversations going around skills and building some skills in a very short period of time. Usually my workshops are quite a bit longer, half a day, a day. I'll do them at conferences, I'll do them at different places. This is a different idea. We're online, I'm not face to face with you. It's one hour long, so we're gonna have to move quick. I hope everybody brought pen and paper or a whiteboard or something to type on, um, a document to type into. If you don't have one of those things, go grab it, we'll wait. No, no, I'm not really gonna wait for you, but go ahead and grab those and we'll, we'll be right back. So um, once again, I'm Paul Merrill. I'm from Beaufort Fairmont Automated Testing Services and we are based in Cary, North Carolina, right near the Research Triangle. Love to do this every month. Um, love to work with you on new skills, testing skills or automation skills. Love meeting you all and I wanna build relationships with this and start getting to know you. Today is gonna to be very interactive. So I'm looking for people who are interested in giving feedback and giving their thoughts and their experiences as we go through this. This is gonna be very hands-on for you. A um, Little bit about me, you see my Twitter address down there, D. Paul Merrill, feel free to follow me on there. Uh, tweet things out during this conversation, this workshop, if you'd like. My company, both for Paramount, focuses on automated testing. So that's what we do. We eat, sleep, live, and breathe it. We work with companies to do things like syncing up development and testing in agile environments. We work with companies to automate regression testing. And we work with companies to get better at testing in general. So we do consultations, which means we can come in and help you set up a strategy for your automated testing. We help companies through training, whether that's through Selenium training, API testing training, testing training in general, or we also do uh, dedicated people. So we've got several people out there working right now with companies across the US and helping them do great things with test automation. So if you need that kind of help, give me a yell. A couple things real quick, a few upcoming events. The next webinar will be in June. I don't have a date for that. I've got a guest that I'm working with on it. I believe it's gonna be a little bit deeper into technology, and we're gonna probably talk a little bit about strategy with continuous delivery, but I've gotta get that figured out. So thank you for your patience on that. Look for an email from me. You'll find that coming to you prior to the webinar. Um, secondly, in, on the 13th, I will be doing a workshop at TriTog, which is the Triangle Test Automation Users Group in Raleigh. I was selected, I'm very, very fortunate and happy and humbled to be selected again this year by STPCon to do both a workshop and a session on service virtualization. So this meetup at 6.30 at WebAssign in, at TriTog in Raleigh is gonna give me the chance and you the chance to start hardening up this workshop, making sure that it's ready to go for STPCon in October. So we're actually gonna do hands-on work with Hoverfly, a free, service virtualization tool and learn how to use it and what service virtualization is and how it can work. And finally, on the 19th at 11 a.m., I will, Eastern, and all these are East Coast times uh, in the United States. 
I'll be doing machine learning and testing, machine learning and how it affects testers for C lights on a webinar. So make sure to look for that. Last, but before we get started, stick around to the end of the webinar. I always give away a $50 Amazon gift card. Stick around for your chance for that. Great. So let's get started. I know that some of you found this through my blog post on the website. Some of you found it through other ways. Um, I'm happy that you're here. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I came about this idea and why we're doing this and give you a little bit of background and framing for this conversation. But before I do that, I always like to get to know people a little bit and understand who it is we're working with here, who we're talking with. So tell me what your role is. I've got tester, test automation engineer, developer, manager. I just launched a poll that you ought to be able to see there. So just take a minute. I'm going to, I'm going to close this down pretty quickly, but I just want to get some roles. So great. We've got about 75% voting. That's great guys. That's great. So I'll close this down 77%. And I'm going to share these results with you so that you can see them. Hopefully you can see them right now. Looks like a lot of testers. So 42% testers, 30% test automation engineers, 24% managers, a couple developers and a couple others. So that's great. We've got the people we want here um, to start this out. So let's get going. And if you have trouble seeing my slide again, let me know. Sometimes switching back and forth between polls like that can be a challenge. If you read the blog post on this on beauforkfairmont.com slash blog or slash blogs, I forget which it is, you know the story. The rest of you don't, so I'm going to explain it really quickly. My friend Angie Jones and I worked on building up a tutorial for conferences called The Dominators of Automation. And some of you have probably been to that workshop. One part of it in starting, starting the workshop is we ask testers that join us to write down as many tests about an application under, the te under test that they can think of. Come up with as many ideas of tests as you can, as many test cases for this as you can. We give them five minutes. And what I found over time was that a lot of people had trouble with this. I couldn't quite figure out what it was. We tried a couple of different things to figure it out, and we still found that people had trouble with this. And in the end, of, at our swan song for this workshop at Star East a few weeks ago, I asked, hey, how many of you had trouble spending five minutes coming up with ideas of what to test for your application and your test? And more than half of the group raised their hands. And I, I kind of felt like it might be something like that because you could see people kind of staring off into space and you know, tapping their pen and trying to think of ideas to come up with. And that's okay. We're all at different places in our development. We're all at different places in, in how we think through testing. We're all coming to this with different contexts and different sets of experience. But what we would see continuously is that we would break teams up and for a group of, of four people on a team, we break that up and each one of those people would have five minutes to write test cases. And then when they came back together and deduplicated test cases, so got rid of replicas or, or duplicate tests, we would still have teams with 10 tests. And to me, that it kind of blows my mind, right? So if you have 10 tests by four people, is 2.5 tests per person over five minutes. So we're looking at like, one test case every two minutes, if I've done the math right, that seems really slow to me. And so I thought, you know, how are we ever going to cover the surface area of these products these days if we don't create test cases and come up with ideas for tests very, very fast? So I thought this might be a good way for us to work together to come up with these ideas um, faster. So we've got some exercises we're going to do. A lot of people think that person who can come up with a lot of test ideas versus the person who can't, well, they can do it because they've got a tester's mindset, right? And I hear about tester's mindset a lot, and I've determined for myself, the idea of tester's mindset is just hogwash. It's just no good. It tries to make us feel special as testers. Hey, I can do testing really well because I've got this built-in thing called tester's mindset this is what it is. You can't, if you can't do it, you can't do it. It's on or off, it's binary. There's no, there's no changing it. You just need to have it or you don't. Well, that's one way to look at things, but 
there are a lot of really big problems with that. And one is, let's say that you work for me, that I'm the boss, you work for me, I'm a manager or whatever, and you're a tester. And you come to me and you say, okay, I've been here 10 years, it's time for a raise. I say, okay, tell me why you deserve a raise. And they're like, well, I'm, I have a really good tester's mindset. Okay, well, what are, what are you doing differently in your 10th year than you did in your first year? Well, I'm, I've been here longer. I, I, I've been, I just deserve a raise. Well, there's a problem with that, right? If I'm the boss and I hear this and I say, okay, you're, you're coming to me saying that you have this ingrained thing of a tester's mindset. And that's what I'm supposed to pay you for. But you haven't changed it over time and you can't do anything about it. Nobody else can either. Why wouldn't I just go get somebody who hasn't been here for 10 years, who has just as good or better mindset and pay them less, right? So there's some problems with the idea of tester's mindset. A second problem that I see a lot is, it seems like not very many people can actually define for me what it is or what makes it up. So I have a really strong challenge to you with that. Sit down and think through that. But let's get back to what's at hand here, the idea of creating ideas for test cases. In art, I've seen this a lot. So I'm not an artist, but when I've sat down and tried to do art, I've noticed a couple things. If I sit down in a room with lots and lots of different medium, lots of different tools, like you see here in this picture, it's gonna be very, very difficult for me to decide what to create. Maybe other people don't have this concern. I certainly do. If I can sit down in front of a piece of paper and write about anything, it's gonna be much more difficult for me to decide what to write than if I had some constraints on it. So I believe that the medium in art is a constraint. And a constraint, when used instead of being surrendered to, can be liberating. I think that if we decide we're going to work in acrylics with acrylic brushes on canvas, and please excuse me, I'm not a painter, I don't know what I'm talking about, but that's a lot easier to decide what to do than if you just have a lot, a lot of different things around us. And in fact, sometimes we can take that medium and twist it and turn it and mess with that constraint in such a way that we get more creativity out of it and greater pieces of art, things that we experience and feel differently about. So that's kind of where I'm coming from this on. I think that as testers, one of the constraints that we have sometimes is methodology or process. Sometimes it's functionality. Sometimes it's something else completely. But I want to talk a little bit about that methodology because I think that having methodology within testing, having your own methodology or using someone else's can be very, very helpful. It can be like that constraint, that medium that we're working through as artists. And we can use that need to be liberated by it by using it for our needs and have power over it, power over the art. Or we can surrender to it and be powerless. Oh, all I can do is create an acrylic today. And there's a lot of great things that can still be done with that. So let's get to work. Hopefully you guys are ready for work. We're going to spend five minutes writing down test ideas. You're going to do this individually. If you don't have your pen and paper, go get it. <laughs> if you're typing, that's fine. If you have a document open, get a document going on your computer there. I'm trying to slow down here to make sure that we're ready to go. And what I want you to do is look around your physical space, the space around you, pick one object, and I want you to write tests for that object. Okay, so come up with ideas of what to test with that object. We have five minutes, and I'm gonna start the timer now and we're going to debrief afterwards so i'll be looking for volunteers to share their experience with me go
If you're just joining us, if you're coming in a little bit late, what everyone do, is doing right now is that they are writing down test ideas. So they have picked a physical object in their area. Wherever they are, they picked a physical object and they're writing down as many test cases as they can think of for that object, as many tests as they can. Just a minute and a half left here. For those of you who joined us a little bit late, I keep seeing a few attendees come in. So I just want to make you aware what everybody's doing is they've picked a physical object in their area and they've decided to write and they are writing down as many tests as they can about it in five minutes. We're down to about a minute here. Hopefully you all are breezing through this. Um, I can't wait to hear the results. So I hope you're ready to share with me your thoughts after this one minute left here. Okay, you, hopefully you hear that buzzer. It's getting close, five seconds here. All right, all right, great. Thank you very much, pencils up, pencils down, whatever the right um, language is for that. Here's, here's what I wanna do. I wanna do a quick survey to find out how many of these test ideas you had. So if you can answer pretty quickly here, I have less than five, five to 10, 11 to 20, uh, just select the one that works for you, 21 plus, and let's see what people were, were able to do here. And I, I, would, I would say if you're in a room full of people, just take the average, just ask kind of what the average is maybe. Uh, I know that that's a little bit harder situation to figure out. Great, so I'm gonna close this poll up and share the results. It looks like a lot of people had 11 to 20, so that was the, the biggest number here. Uh, five to 10, quite a few, and some folks less than, than five. So if you're one of those, um, well, let's, let's, let me just ask you this. Um, those of you who had a lot, would you mind sharing? Um, sharing your thoughts about why it is you believe you had a lot of test cases. So like if you were one of the ones that was 21 plus, you can either type in your questions or you can raise your hand and I'd be happy to, um, to have you contribute here. I really want to get some discussion going and hear different points of view. That's going to play into this a lot. So if you had a whole lot of these, if you were part of that 7% and you don't mind sharing, you type in to the question section why you think you had a lot um, or raise your hand. 
and, and sometimes what I find is that my question is bad and that people aren't <laughs> able to share because of it, so I'll try this. If you were one of the ones who found this challenging, help me understand your feelings with that and what was going on. Okay, so Laura says she had a lot of these because she loves these type of games, okay? All right, that's great. Thank you, Laura, I appreciate that. Anybody else want to share their experience with that, what they found, was this easy, was it difficult? I'm, I, all right, I'm getting nothing back, so I'm okay, able to, it, oh, here are a few. It takes a little while to type sometimes, I think that's what's going on. So, um, Amara says, able to repeat tests for different environments. Okay, so paper types for scissors. Paper types for scissors, gotcha, right? So the environment being the paper, the scissors being the application or something along those lines. So yeah, able to repeat different things for different environments. So that's one way to get a lot of test cases if you separate by environment or by situation. That's terrific, Amara, thank you. Um, Denise says, a lot. Of, I had a lot of tests because I picked an object with a ton of features. Okay, all right. That's great. So it's, and it's just one person says, hey, it's just easy to brainstorm. It's just easy for me to brainstorm about things. Um, Deb says, hey, I'm, for, I'm familiar with this item. I use it quite frequently, so that helped me come up with, with test cases. Now, how often is that the case when you're more familiar with an application or less familiar with an application? You find more or less test cases for it. And we would have some interesting discussions about that. I would have had more if I had more time. Sure. Great. So she didn't run out of, Deb didn't run out of, didn't run out of, uh, Question. She ran out of time. Um, so won't, Jeff says, won't the number of tests depend on the object selected? I love this question. I want to hear what you guys think about that. I know for myself, I don't find that much of a difference um, because each object is just so interesting. Uh, this pen, for instance, I have sat in front of people for two minutes at a time just spouting off every idea that I could think about testing this pen. So I'm not sure that it depends. I mean, they, they, maybe so, maybe if there's something that's just very, very simple, but I think even a light switch, um, a light switch is simple on the surface, it just turns on and off, but then there are a lot of ways to test it. And if you're thinking in terms of white box testing and you crack that, that light switch open, you start messing with stuff, there's a lot of test cases you could do with it. If you think about what the light switch affects, uh, there are a lot of different things that we could do there. There are just a lot, I think most even simple objects are very easy with this. So thank you very much for your feedback here. I'm not going to be able to get to each one of these, but I want to make sure that we get as much done here as we can. So um, I think for me, this comes back to several ideas. So I wanted to have a moment to kind of debrief a little bit here. Um, and, and I'm going to get some people to, to talk here in just a minute. But I think for me, um, there are several things that are really important. With this idea of test ideas. And I'm specifically calling it a test idea. I'm not calling it a test case. People have problems with that terminology. Um, I'm not calling it a check. I have problems with that terminology. Um, I think, I think there, this, this, this is an idea. It's a thing that we want to test. And in order to think about this, we need to make sure that we know what a test is. So when I started interrogating this term of a test and, and in the context of software, I realized there's really two things that I do with the test. And maybe there are more, please let me know if you know what those are that are more than what I'm thinking about. But basically there are two types of tests. There's a test that I do for exploration and there's a test that I do for experimentation. So for exploration, that's the activity of trying to learn about an object that I don't know much about or learn more about an object that I feel like I already know about. So exploration is one piece of this. Experimentation, on the other hand, is sitting down and saying, okay, I, have a, I believe I know something that should happen to this object. It's my hypothesis. I'm going to use that hypothesis and develop an experiment around it to determine whether or not the thing my control is, is related to my variable, right? So I'm going to vary one piece of information, one piece of data that I put into it, one behavior and how I interact with this object or application. And when I vary that, I'm going to determine the out, if the outcome is what it should be, right? So I make, I, I vary my input, and I look at the output, and I determine, is the output the same as with the control, or is it something different than with the control? That's an experiment, right? So we have kind of a null hypothesis that we're working with, 
That's our control. That's our um, that's our positive test case. That's our baseline, right? So that's an experiment. So we're doing these two different two different things. Um, I hear a bunch of people saying they're having trouble seeing slides, and oh, you're absolutely right. It looks like that's not working. Mm -hmm. Looks like my slide is just not showing, so I'm going to try a couple things here. Thank you for the feedback. And we'll get this figured out here in just a minute. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, so I still have that. I still have the, uh, the survey on. I'm going to turn this off. These things are always so much harder to do when you're in front of people. My results. Now you should be able to see my screen. Looks like it. Up here. Now hopefully that's a little bit better. Thank you for your help there. So, so there's an exploration and there's an experiment. Now it seems to me it's going to take a lot more time to think of an experiment and design an experiment than it's going to be to determine what my next step should be in an exploration. And there are different things that inform each of these, but they have several constraints that are similar. We're going to talk to those a little bit. But all right, that, that's where I'm coming from on this. So I think if we're doing exploration, if we're doing exploratory testing, it's very easy sometimes to come up with the next step. We just look ahead of us and determine the next thing to do. That That's kind of this path that we're going down. Maybe we take a step back and we look at, hey, how could I have done this differently? But the experiment, on the other hand, is a little bit more difficult. But I just kind of wanted to speak to that. I want to do another exercise um, as, as this is moving forward here. Another exercise, I want you to write down bad ideas. I'm going to tell you why I'm doing this in just a minute. But we're going to spend a few minutes, three minutes, writing down bad ideas. So you just had this object, this physical object in your area. You came up with test ideas. And I have a feeling that you were trying to think of good test cases. So if you're in exploratory testing, you're thinking of good things to do. Maybe you're thinking of ways to test something, ways to interact with it um, that are helpful. What would a bad test look like? How do you come up with a bad test idea? That's what I want you to do here. The same physical object, and I'm gonna give you some examples. Let's say that my object was a chair. Now, there's a lot of tests that I could do on a chair. I'm sitting in a chair right now. But I could, for instance, let it sit there until something happens to it. Now, I might call that a bad test case because it's open-ended. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't have a certain set of expert ex experiments. I don't have a certain expectation for what's going to happen. On the other hand, some people could think it was a very good test case because anything could happen and you get to test different variations. It's much more exploratory than a controlled experiment type test, right? Another idea would be to turn it upside down and try to sit on it. So this one has wheels, but sitting on the wrong side of the chair sounds like a really bad idea. It could harm me. So there's this underlying assumption I probably had in coming up with good test cases that were do not be harmed by the test case. Uh, do not let it be open-ended. Um, for instance, I could see if the chair burns, but I, I'm inside my office. I don't want to do that. That's a terrible idea. I can burn down the office, right? Um, so that's a bad test. So spend three minutes. I'm going to start it now. Same object, bad test ideas. Go.
All right, we're down to about a minute here. Keep thinking of bad test ideas for your object. Keep writing them down. All right, here we go. We've got that Casio sounding alarm going here. It's almost done. All right, great. Thank you for participating in that. So I want to debrief here. I've got a couple questions from the previous session that I want to pick up on. And then I want to get some hands raised here. I'm going to go back. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put down everybody's hand because I didn't actually bring anybody on the line to talk through this before. Raise your hand if you want to talk through a part of this and I'm going to answer a couple of these questions and talk to them as we're going here. So one of the questions that we had here comments was from Dwayne and Dwayne says, should we really care about the number of test ideas or test cases versus which test ideas appear to challenge the risk of the product? I think that's a great idea. Now remember the context of this session, right? So my context for this session is, hey, I noticed that it seems like people have a problem creating test case ideas. Here is a workshop to try to work on creating more test case ideas. So when we say, hey, should we really care about that? It's a great question, but it's not really in the scope here. So here's what I'm gonna say. I think you make a really good point, um, even though it's outside the scope a little bit. I think you make a really good point. Um, I, I think that the more ideas we can come up with, chances are the more risks we can identify and or the more we can identify the nature of our risk. So one of the things that I noticed with automated testing or with test automation is the more test cases that I create, the more likely I am to understand the nature of a particular thing. So that's just kind of how I explore the world. Uh, and it, it, there are certainly many more ways to do this, but today we're talking about working on the skill of creating more test ideas. So that's a terrific question. Um, just, uh, and I'm, I'm, hey, look, Dwayne, I'm the kind of person who wants to undermine the whole premise of things too. So I totally get where you're coming from. Let's see. So who's got their hand up? Um, I want to hear about your experience. I'm going to take you off a of mute here. This is Eric F. So I'm going to unmute you, Eric. Eric, what was were your thoughts on this? The bad ideas. Um, we had things. Uh, any tests that waste time vis-a-vis -vis the objectives of the product. So it involves defining what the objectives of the product are. Um, tests that fail to produce any useful information. Um, tests that repeatedly test the same thing, like if you've already tested it once, why test it again over and over, uh, and then surface level type tests, like ones that don't go very deep um, into a scenario. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm going to take, put you back on mute here. Um, I think that's terrific, Eric. So it seems like Eric and his team came up with abstractions of what would make for a bad test. I want to hear some specifics too. A couple of things that were pointed out here are very much judgment calls and based on experience um, that I'm hearing from you guys there. One is useful info. Does it produce useful info? So we're prejudging the test case as to whether or not it has useful info. And sometimes that can be to our detriment. Sometimes an experiment or an ex exploration can be very helpful without knowing whether or not there's useful info. Sometimes we get useful information, sometimes we don't. But absolutely, I agree with you in the sense that for tests, we like to get information, and we would like for that information to be useful. Sometimes prejudging can keep us from very valuable information, though, right? So information that tells us that the test itself or the behavior wasn't useful, that's that could be valuable. So it's, it's a little weird how we think through this. Repeating the same thing, sometimes it's very helpful. So for me, and, and I hear this all the time from developers specifically. I don't know what your role is there, Eric, but um, I hear this a lot from highly technical people, from developers, from people who think with that engineering mindset. Because I see again and again, we think in terms of efficiencies as opposed to outcomes. And efficiencies can be helpful. 
good outcomes do not necessarily always come from high efficiency. Sometimes there are low efficiency things we do that have very, very high value, right? So there are different ways to think through this. Uh, repeating the same thing, so the same test case again and again. Well, what if you repeat the same test case on two different environments? That's repeating a test case, but you may be getting very helpful information from two different environments or on three. Maybe you're repeating the same test case at different points in time. So if you have something that's time sensitive, you won't find out about that if you never repeat the execution of it. Now, in both of those two cases, I was talking about the execution of it rather than a persisted test case, like a piece of code, a piece of uh, automated test in code, right? One of the things that I hear a lot is, hey, look, we've got these unit tests that do this. We've already unit tested that. There's no reason to do any service level tests or UI tests. And testers will tell you again and again, we have all heard someone say, oh, I unit tested that. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to do that test again. Well, it's let experience be the guide on that. Talk to some folks who have experienced that. Many times I see the very same test case running with two different sets of um, two different uh, two different contexts. So if I have a unit test that, for instance, goes in and checks to see if a non-ASCII character can be in a password versus an integration test where I'm calling into a service or I'm calling into a library or whatever else doing the same thing, I might get different information from those two tests because they're calling through different pieces of the code. But the test itself might be exactly the same. It's just interacting with more of the code in one case, case, case than the other. So I, I want to open doors here and open ways of thinking. Um, and continue to do that. Great, thank you so much, Eric. I'm gonna pull Deb off of mute. So, Deb, are you there? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, you know, I found this harder than actually finding the good cases. <laughs> right. Because I was automatically like eliminating all those cases because they were already good. Um, but one thing I found was in some cases, thinking about the bad test, I came up with a couple more good possible tests. You know, for example, I've got my tea mug here and, um, you know, grabbing the mug while it's got really hot tea in it would be a bad test because you'll get burned just like sitting on the bottom of a chair. But if this is supposed to be a thermally insulated mug, then I should be able to grab it. So that would be a good test case. I so it. it's interesting that even do it looking for bad ideas, you can find good ideas. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Deb. So. Uh, the way that I, I did not come up with that activity on my own, I read about it somewhere else. And what they were basically saying was that there are, are things that can come out of tweaking the way you're thinking about something. Um, so doing the opposite of what you intend to do sometimes can be helpful, like you said. Uh, so for instance, maybe it's a thermally insulated mug and you hadn't thought of, hey, will it burn me? Uh, there's a lot of gray in there too. And there's a lot of continuum, like at what point should it burn? How do I define at what point it should burn? Is that in the requirements? If not, should it be? Um, is it in the story? Should it be? Do users care about it? Should they, right? Does our production care about it? Um, should this material transfer heat or not? There are a lot of different questions there that we can do. A bad test might be taking your mug and throwing it down on the ground and breaking it, right? It's a bad test because you'll never be able to repeat the same test you would have otherwise on that mug. So you have to know where your last test is in order to do that one. Right, and and someone mentioned on here, I finished my test, so it was really easy. This was easy because I, I wrote all the tests. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. I guarantee you, you did not. Someone on this call, someone out there, will take the object. Just go take it to a friend, give them your list, and see if you finish. Because there are more test cases. I guarantee you, to whatever object it was, I can't even think of a boring enough object to not test almost infinitely. There, you're not done testing. You won't be done testing. That's a big part of what our job is as testers is to determine when we believe is a valid time for, um, for stopping testing, when, when we believe we have reduced risk or helped reduce risk or identified risk to a point that the business can move forward. So we'll never be done testing with just about anything. So uh, I, I would dispute whether or not you were actually done. Um, here, I'm gonna do one more person on the phone and then we're gonna go to our next activity and I've got a couple comments here. So this is Tony. So Tony, would you like to share? And, and it sounds like Tony, you got quiet. You have your hand up, Tony J. Okay, he put his hand down. I heard. can't hear you. I don't know if you don't have a mic or it's not working. We'll try something else. Thank you for, for wanting to share. There's a couple questions here, a couple comments. I'm going to try to read through. 
Yeah, so do you keep thinking of good ideas even though why you were th trying to think of the bad ones? Yeah, isn't that weird, right? So you're trying to think of the bad ones, but you can't get your brains off of the good ones. Isn't that against the rules? Yeah, but sometimes I'm just trying to set you up in such a way that you are forced to think about things differently and break the rules. As testers, a lot of times we break rules. That's a big part of what we do. So now here's something I want you to take home with you. We're not going to do any more of those particular types of exercise. I've got another exercise to do to close up here. And I'm talking fast because we are starting to run out of time. What is the one thing that you could change to make one of those bad ideas a good test idea? So this is a fun thing. So take that list. Take it after this. Sit down with it. Take one of those ideas that were bad. What's the one little thing that you could tweak about it to make it into a good idea? And then try that again. What's a different thing that I could tweak about or how could I tweak it differently to make this um, a good idea? And then do that with the different I test idea, bad ideas. So sometimes creativity comes from really weird places. We can use engaging, hopefully engaging exercises uh, like this to think of those types of things. I like to find a way, a process, an exercise, some type of activity to get my brain working a different way. Next. This is a different one. Hopefully you've got your pen and your paper. Um, yeah, and it, it looks like Tony didn't have a mic. Thank you, Tony. Um, thanks for your, your approach. And if you want to write in a question, Tony, instead of, um, of, of your mic, that's fine, or your comments, and I'll try to look at it here in a minute. This is something that I found in college. So I started out, those who know me really well, and, and actually, or were around when this was happening, know that I started out in college as an English major. So I had a focus on writing, and the reason that I did it was I was probably lazy. I found out that I was getting really good grades on all the papers that I wrote, so I may as well do a major in writing. Um, it turned out that that's not the direction that I went. I moved into computer science after a while, and uh, the rest is history. But during that um, 105 hours with uh, undergraduate studies plus English before I switched over to computer science and none of them really transferred to that other field. Um, during that experience, I had a couple of exercises that were really interesting that I want to bring back. One of them was I had a professor who would have us write for a specific period of time. And uh, they would say, okay, here's the deal, and we're going to do this together. So you're going to grab your pen, your pencil, your laptop, and document, whatever it is, and you're going to write for the next three minutes, and you're going to do it without stopping. So if you're with pen, pen doesn't leave the paper. If you're with, I mean, except for spaces between letters or words or whatever, depending on how you write. If you're typing, you don't stop typing. You just keep going and keep going and keep going. I'm going to give you the topic this time because I know some of you have been thinking about it for the last 30 seconds that I've been explaining this, so you're cheating. Um, I want to give you the topic so that you're forced to think of something new and to write about it, okay? So three minutes, it's gonna start here in just a second. Your topic is air. Okay, air, and starting out three minutes, write without stopping, I want you writing the entire three minutes.
All right, we're down to a minute here. If you're sitting there looking up in the sky and your pen isn't moving, your fingers aren't typing, you're doing it wrong, just type. It doesn't matter what you write down. Just write it down. Just keep writing. Whatever, whatever you can type, just type it. And we will be uh, done with this exercise in about 45 seconds. So keep it going. Here's that uh, Casio watch I had in third grade going off again. Thank you so much for that. All right, I want to hear some feedback from this. Um, if you would like to, let me do this. I'm going to clear the hands here. So I can kind of this. All right, so um, a couple people with their hands up. Let me know your thoughts. I see a couple that have already tried to speak. I'm going to, I see Tony's hand up again, but he said he didn't uh, have that. Yeah, so let's see. Any questions you want to type in or comments? I'm going to go back to Eric. He's ready with a thought here. So, Eric, what are your thoughts about this activity? Uh, so we just basically, uh, large picture is it's very hard to come up with bad ideas because if you just track it and write it down, like you can somehow or another get something good out of it. Um, so, like, to go through the bad ideas we had, like, any test that's a waste of time is a view of the objectives. So we just need to, like, talk to our product owners and, like, get prioritizations or clarifications on the objectives to turn the, some of those ideas into good ones. Tests that provide use, like, that don't provide useful information. We would uh, capture and organize the data in some way. So, like, we could use it for telemetry. Or so what about, even if it's let me interrupt you, Eric. Let me interrupt you. This last activity where we were writing continuously, did you all do that? Not really, no. Okay. <laughs> we were all talking right. about that idea thing. Okay, great. Well, thank you for sharing that. I'm going to go to somebody who, who did this. Thanks. So let's see. John is ready. All right, John, what, what were your thoughts on this activity of just writing for three minutes? Was this easy? Was it difficult? Let me know your thoughts here. You're unmuted. Okay, maybe he doesn't have a mic either. I see his hand up there, and I tried to, uh, to help him out. So how about, um, let's see, Renee? Renee, you have your hand up. I'm gonna unmute you. Okay, Renee, are you there? I'm here. Hey, what were your thoughts about this activity? It was basically a long stream of consciousness. Yeah. For me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I went from air to basically thin water to where does it go from air, atmosphere to space? Where's that line? And just constantly, it's like, well, what about this? Well, what about that? Okay, well, now, did your, did, is there anything of value in that writing? Like, in terms of your understanding of air, um, was there anything of value in there in terms of the way that you describe air or think about it? Did anything new? come out in your writing? Um, mostly like water cycle, cloud formation, um, how we can breathe air, but we can't breathe, breathe water, and you can't breathe air up higher. Um, the closer you get to space, the oxygen level is lower. Like So it just kind of went all over the place. But I like yeah. could pinpoint little things there. Yeah, so, so I'm going to thank you very much for sharing that. I appreciate you being willing to share. It takes a lot of guts to be on here. And Eric, I hope I didn't uh, shut, you, shut you guys down there. I feel like I kind of did. But I was trying to focus on this and with the, the limited amount of time left here. So uh, if that came off the wrong way, I apologize to you and to anyone else um, that, that needs it. But I guess, so Renee, I, I, I like what you're saying there. I think that um, the reason that I wanted to bring this up is because um, I, I believe sometimes what we do is really is really helpful in coming up with new ideas. So I read something um, 
And I wrote something about this on LinkedIn. It was talking about when you're not motivated. Okay, they say, you know, when you're not motivated to do anything, pick one of the things that you need to do and just start doing it. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter if you're motivated or not, just do something. If you do anything, you'll start to feel more motivated about that thing and you'll start to get more excited. And I find that's the case a lot with things like writing. So I do a lot of, of writing. And for a while there, I was writing for an hour or more every morning, starting early in the morning. And if I didn't have anything to write about, I would just start writing. Um, or I had a list of topics and I'll pick one and just start typing in. And with my writing, the way that I do it is I'll generally just brainstorm. I'll just throw stuff down on paper to get it down on paper. So this is about ideation, about creating ideas. I'll throw it down on paper. It doesn't matter if the language is right. It doesn't matter if the sentence structure is right. It doesn't matter if I got the idea out there right or not. But get it down on paper because then you can come back and layer on that analytical ability over it. So while we may not have found much about air and about learning about air from this description or, or, or from your activity here, there may be things that you go back later and you're like, hey, wait a minute, maybe I understand air a little bit differently because of this or that, or maybe I thought of things that I hadn't thought of before. Test cases are much the same way. And I'm trying to get to that point where we're, we're trying to get things out of our head and down on the paper so that later we can come back and find out if it's any good. So creation is not necessarily about coming up with prejudged great ideas. It's about coming up with anything and then coming, and at least this is my process, yours may be different, um, but it's coming up with anything and then coming back later and, and analyzing and filtering out what's good and not. So hopefully that was a helpful activity. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a couple of these. So yeah, so Dwayne says, I found this writing activity difficult because I wasn't sure what to write about. So I started with things that I thought I knew about there. And I think that's a great way to start. How often do we do that with our testing? We, we, we almost have to. We start with things we know about, and then we start building out from there. Um, and sometimes it helps us identify what we don't need to know about. Um, Mike says, I, this seemed like it would be difficult, but it was really quite easy, so just, just writing. Um, I think that you can get a lot out of this. Sometimes if you just start doing the thing that you think is difficult, it's going to get easier over time, and you're going to get a lot farther. We've got five minutes left. I want to respect your time because... <laughs> In the United States, it's Memorial Day weekend, and a lot of people got drives to the beach right after lunch here. So, um, so I'm going to try to get through this. Um, so let's see, learning discipline and practice. So I think that where these testing ideas come from are basically three things. I think that our testing ideas come from our experience, which is filtered through our own senses, our own mindset, and the way that we think. So our experiences secondhand experience. I like to call this rumors, right? So other people's experience that we hear about and then it's filtered through both them and through us. So secondhand experience and then formalized learnings. So basically some set of experiences that have been formalized into either education, models, maps, outlines, things of this nature. Um, so formalized learnings. I think those are the three main things that we use in creating tests. So if we know where they're coming from, we can help define it. So we can increase our experience by practicing and by doing things differently over time. We can increase secondhand experience by finding communities and groups of people that will share their experience. Twitter is terrific for testing and for learning about testing. Reading blogs is a great way to do that. Having conversations um, at meetups and at other places, at conferences, and getting those other experiences. And sharing yours is very important as well, because somebody needs to hear what you've experienced to be able to add context to what they're doing. Formalized learning. So these can be terrific ways of adding to this as well. I think a lot of times we see somebody who's good at this and we just think it's magic, right? It's just, they're just so good at this. They just, they get it naturally. It's magic, however they do it. It's not. For them, I'm just like for anybody else. These are built upon skills. It takes time to learn them and there are some ways to cheat. One of the ways to cheat is by learning from other people. That formalized experience that I talked about or secondhand experience. Um, there are some tools out there for how to do this. We're going to talk through a few of them very, very briefly because we're running out of time. Uh, I'm going to tell you what my process is for ideation. It's basically this, that I, I figure out what the happy path is to set a baseline or a control for a particular function that I'm trying to understand. Then I start working on negative ways of working with it, ways to produce something different from what my original happy path was. I look at boundaries of the particular situation, the function. I look at edge cases. Um, so what happens with max int plus one, what happens with min int minus one, those types of things. Uh, repeat through the tree. So I think of a functional structure within an application as being a tree 
um, model, a tree, tree um, structure, and talk to a developer if you don't know what I mean by that. And you can either go breadth first through that or depth first, and there are different situations for each. Um, I've only got two minutes left, and we got to get to the giveaway. So I want to make sure to do that. I hope you all learned a lot today. Please send me feedback, paul at gopherfairmont.com. Uh, and the winner is, I'm waiting for the end of the drum roll this time. Hopefully you can hear it. <laughs> the winner is Laura E. So Laura E, there was only one Laura E on there. And you are the winner of a $50 Amazon gift card. If you don't hear from me with that within the next uh, business day, please send me an email. I want to get to know you. I told you before we help companies develop strategies for test automation and we help them implement it. If you're in that case and you're saying, I really would like someone to come in, give us another set of perspectives, sit down and help us plan the strategy for this, we save tons of time wasted. We save tons of money by developing a strategy that we know will work because we've done this a lot, a lot of times. We can also help you with the people to do this as well. I'd love to talk through your challenges. I always do a free consultation. So if you want to set one of those up, reach out to me here. Once again, I always appreciate people who show up on this. Thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful holiday weekend if you're in the United States. Otherwise, have a wonderful weekend if you're somewhere else. And I hope to see you all next time and you'll get an email from me about that. Thank you so much and we will see you soon.